1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 to 20. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for adulterers and perverts, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which he entrusted to me. I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory, honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by following them you may fight the good fight, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Stan. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you this morning. I'm Joe, if we haven't met yet, and um, it's a privilege to be opening up this passage in 1 Timothy. Let me say welcome as well to our older Grub Group children who are in the talk this morning. Um, it's great to have you here. Let's pray again as we come to God's words. Let's pray for his help. Our Father in heaven, as we've just read, you are the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God And to you belongs honour and glory forever and ever. We pray that as we come to your word and hear it together, that all the glory would go to you as we hear the wonderful news that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, as Elias said, we're in the second week of our series in 1 Timothy. And one of the things that astonishes me about this letter and this context is just how quickly a church can lose the gospel. Just how quickly a church can lose the gospel. Now Paul is writing to Timothy, who's in Ephesus. And Paul, uh, when he travelled to Ephesus, spent about three years in the city teaching the gospel, uh, bringing the word of God to them, and establishing and strengthening these believers in Ephesus. They had three years of excellent Bible teaching and solid preaching and a firm grounding in the news about Jesus. And yet here we are in 1 Timothy, and it's only taken about five or six years for false teaching to spring up in this church like weeds in a garden. We're currently in the year 2022. Just think forward to the year 2027. That's how long it took for false teaching to get a grip. I could easily stand here and recount stories of churches throughout history who have started out loving the gospel and living out the gospel who are now a million miles away from sound teaching. We could recount stories of whole denominations or networks of churches that um, have wandered away from from the truth. 
Paul talks later in 1 Timothy about the church being the pillar and foundation of the truth. Local churches all over the world are called to fight to protect and proclaim the truth of salvation. And yet how quickly a church can turn back from God's truth. Now it's very easy to think that we as a church family are immune to this danger. That it won't be us, that it could never be us. And yet surely every church that has let go of the gospel has thought exactly the same thing at some point in their church life. Paul's words to Timothy in these verses are words that we all need to pay careful attention to. If we want to be a gospel church, a church that holds on to the truth and that holds out the truth to a dying world, then these verses remind us that we will have to fight for it. This is what Timothy says, uh, Paul says to Timothy in verse 18, if you look at it with me, fight the good fight. Timothy must engage in the battle to maintain the gospel at the heart of this church in Ephesus. But it's not just a command to Timothy. Right at the end of Paul's letter, when he writes the words, grace be with you, as we thought about last week, it's a plural you in the original language. We can't sort of capture that in English, but it's like the Americans would say, y'all, y'all. Grace be with y'all. It's that kind of idea. Um, so we sometimes see uh, you know, politicians, don't we, accidentally leaking documents to the media. Well, this letter is being intentionally, intentionally leaked, um, if I can put it like that. It's written to Timothy, but the whole church is supposed to listen in. Which means that all of us, church leaders, Bible teachers, young people, students, adults, if we're people who know Jesus Christ, we need to engage in the fight to preserve and protect the truth of the gospel at the heart of our church life. We're going to see in these verses why it's a fight. We'll see why it's going to take hard work and pain and effort to be and continue to be a church that is faithful to God. But we're also going to see why this is a good fight, why this is a fight that is well worth engaging in, no matter the cost. We'll be reminded that it's only the gospel held out through a local church that has the power to bring salvation to a world that so desperately needs it. That's why we need to fight. Now, if you were here last week, um, as we started 1 Timothy, you'll remember that there were false teachers, as we've already thought about this morning, um, in this church in Ephesus. Just glance back to verse 7 of chapter 1. Paul describes them as people who wanted to be teachers of the law but who do not know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. It's like being a music teacher who thinks the piano needs to be played with drumsticks. They don't know what they're talking about, do they? But the false teachers are not just misguided in their teaching, but also malicious. They are deliberately trying to establish their own agenda in a way that is contrary to the truth of God's word. We're going to see that as we go through this letter and the key issue in our verses, as we come to the first point, is how the false teachers were using the law. They didn't realize that the law was there to expose sin. Just look at verse 8 with me. We know that the law is good if, and this is a significant if, if one uses it properly. So Paul is here talking about God's Old Testament law to his people. And he says that the law is good. The problem is not with the law itself. The problem is how the law is used. The false teachers are not using it properly. And verses 9 to 11 remind us of the proper use of the law. Now we need to be aware that Paul isn't building his entire sort of teaching about the law of God in these uh, few verses. We'll need other letters of the New Testament to build up um, his, his teaching about the law. But he does focus on one main purpose of the law that the false teachers seem to have missed. Have a look with me at verse 9. We also know that law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for adulterers and perverts, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which he entrusted to me. 
Now, as we thought about last week, it's quite hard to pin down exactly what the false teachers are teaching in Ephesus. We don't get given their manifesto or their kind of doctrinal statement that we can read and, and pull apart. We have to sort of work it out from uh, the hints and suggestions throughout the letter about the content and character of their teaching. And we know for sure that their teaching was based on the Old Testament law. We can see that in these verses. We also saw it in verse 4 when we read that they devoted themselves to myths and endless genealogies. They were using details of the Old Testament law, obsessing over things like genealogies, probably adding to them and elaborating on them um, to teach the church. In chapter 6, we read that they were quarreling about words. They seemed to be obsessed with sort of marginal details of the Old Testament law, and they were using these things to guide and instruct the church. And it was leading to controversy, and it was leading to disagreement. But according to Paul, that is the wrong way to use the law. The law is good, but its purpose is to expose sin. It is made for the unrighteous. It is made for lawbreakers. Now, when I was growing up, I used to go on holiday um, to a place in Tuscany where my grandfather grew up. It was an old mill house in the middle of nowhere in the Tuscan mountains. And before we went to bed at night, um, my parents would tell us to get out a UV torch and shine the light around the room in order to identify all the little scorpions that were there in the beds and on the floors and on the walls. They were lurking everywhere. Now, they were little ones that um, you know, couldn't cause you much harm, but you still didn't want to be sharing a bed with them. And so we'd turn the lights off, get the UV torch out, and it would expose all of these little scorpions. Paul says the law functions a little bit like that, like a giant UV light when it comes to sin. It is made for sinners to expose what we're like so that our sin cannot remain in the dark. The law reveals the perfection of God's character so that we might see our own imperfections. It is a law that exposes the sin of the world so that we might see our need of salvation. Now, as human beings, we are tempted, aren't we, to establish our own laws and imagine for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. We think of ourselves as the lawgivers of our own lives who can determine good and evil. That has been the problem since the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve sought to establish the, their own truth and suppress the truth of God's word and turn away from their creator. But God's law comes in and reveals what we're like by showing us God's perfect universal standard of right and wrong. And you might have noticed in verses 9 and 10 that these are not just a random list of law breaking. They're sins that map on to the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. Let me just show you this on the screen, the Ten Commandments that we find in, in uh, Exodus 20 and one or two other places. Let me show you how these commandments relate to the, the verses that we have in 1 Timothy. So, honour your father and mother is the fifth commandment. You shall not murder is the sixth commandment. You shall not commit adultery is the seventh commandment. You shall not steal is the eighth commandment. And you shall not lie is the ninth commandment. Do you see how those things are mapping onto the, the list that we read in 1 Timothy verses 9 and 10? It's tempting for us, I think, to treat God's law, these laws, a bit like a pick and mix. And in every society around the world, people will like certain parts of God's law and dislike other parts of it. They will agree with certain aspects of what God says and disagree with others. Our Western culture, for example, takes real issue with God's commands when it comes to human sexuality. That word uh, pervert in verse 10 has certain connotations in our use of the word today. The original Bible word means those who pervert God's order for sex, particularly those engaged in same-sex practice. Seems ridiculous to our world, doesn't it, to suggest that the only right place for sex is between a man and a woman in marriage. But our culture agrees with other parts of the law we read here. For example, um, the law against stealing, which is kind of 
exhibited in, in, in slave trading, taking what doesn't belong to you. We've seen that our culture is very against that, aren't they? Tearing down statues, defacing things that talk about slave trading. Our culture is very against lying, as we've seen in our political news recently. Do you see how we tolerate certain things in God's law and we don't tolerate other things? And those things will differ from culture to culture and from generation to generation. Standards are so often variable and subject to change. But God's law is not a pick and mix. His unchanging law that reveals his unchanging character acts like a spotlight in every culture around the world, in every generation, exposing every one of us as sinners. Every one of us can read verses 9 to 11 and see ourselves reflected back in those descriptions. Now, I think this is part of the reason why the ministry Timothy is involved in and the ministry we are involved in today is described as a fight. It won't be easy, will it, to hold on to God's standards of right and wrong and to hold out God's standards of right and wrong to a world. God's word will not be universally accepted or universally appreciated. It doesn't feel nice to have our sins, our law-breaking exposed for what it really is. But this is the purpose of God's law, to reveal our sin so that we might be driven to Jesus Christ. The false teachers are using the law to instruct people within the church on how to live rightly. They think the law is made for the righteous, verse 9, to guide and grow the church but they've got the wrong focus. The law can only serve to expose sin and only the gospel has the power to bring salvation. This is our second big idea to grasp, that the gospel saves sinners. Now in these verses, Paul brings us into his own story of becoming a Christian and experiencing the grace of God for himself. If you just look down at these verses, you'll notice all the I's and the me's that are talked about here. And when he tells us his personal story in these verses and uses himself as an example, it's not a digression. His experience of the grace of God teaches us that the gospel is not just for Paul, but for all. I think we could sum it up by saying uh, that, that here in the gospel is overwhelming grace for undeserving sinners to the glory of God. We're going to take those three things in turn. Firstly, overwhelming grace. Have a look at verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Now when Paul says that he was considered faithful, I don't think that he's saying that he was a particularly reliable person or trustworthy person. We're going to see that um, that 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 was not the case as we go through these verses. I think it's better to see the connection here between um, these words and the end of verse 11 where God entrusted Paul with the gospel. Being considered faithful is not about Paul's character, Timothy's character, sorry, Paul's character, but about God's choice. Now recently both of our daughters um, were entrusted with something that they considered very precious from their respective school and preschool, they came home having been entrusted with Paddington Bear. Now, I wonder, preschool, uh, primary school children, whether you've had this experience of being entrusted with something precious from school. These toy bears are given out to children in the class, and the children can take them home, play with them, sleep with them at night, and then come back with all sorts of Paddington stories to tell their class. For Sophie, she wrote down in her book that Paddington had been to church and learned about one Timothy. What what could be more exciting than that? And when the bear comes back to school, it's passed on to the next child for more adventures. Now, I think this is the kind of trust that Paul is talking about in verse 12. Our daughters weren't chosen to take the bears home because of any particular merit of their own, but because the teacher chose them. Paul, the apostle, was not given the gospel through any merit of his own, but was considered trustworthy because the gospel was placed into his trust. He was one appointed into the service of the Lord Jesus. And Christ now strengthens him to carry out that ministry. 
Paul is thankful that he would be entrusted with something so precious and given a ministry so wonderful as someone who is so undeserving. And that theme of what Paul deserves and what Paul receives is a theme that runs throughout verses 12 to 17. As we go through these verses, the gap widens between what Paul deserves and what he receives. And the more that chasm grows in our minds, then the more thankful and humble we will be for the salvation that God has brought. Have a look at verse 13 to start with. Here we get a sense of what Paul deserved from Jesus. He writes, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. Now you might know that Paul wrote a lot of the letters in the New Testament and when you read the letters, they're they're brimming with love and joy. He is open-hearted and warm and generous. But we mustn't lose sight of who Paul was before Jesus rescued him. Acts chapter 8 is an example of what Paul was like. He stands by as a disciple called Stephen is stoned to death and Paul is there nodding his approval. Then we read a couple of verses later that that Saul, which is another name for Paul, began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. That was Paul. He was a devout Jewish leader. He was a Pharisee trained in the law of the Old Testament. He thought he was doing a service to God. But he came to realize later his sin. He describes himself here as a blasphemer. He was profaning the name of God while thinking he was doing a service to God. He describes himself as a persecutor, systematically hunting down Christians and taking them to prison. And he talks about himself as a violent man, nodding his head in approval while Stephen is stoned, in chapter 9, breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Paul was the hardened outspoken atheist and the aggressive internet blog writer and the violent religious extremist all rolled into one. He was doing everything he, could, he possibly could to oppose the message of Jesus and to ravage the church. That was who Paul was. And so what did Paul deserve? Well, he deserved nothing less than the righteous, perfect justice of God. He fully deserved the punishment and wrath of Jesus to be poured out on him. He had no right whatsoever to claim anything from Jesus. And yet, if you look at verse 13, I was shown mercy. Again, verse 16, I was shown mercy. Mercy is the state of affairs where God chooses not to give someone what they deserve. Paul deserved wrath, yet he didn't receive wrath, he received mercy. But there's a tricky little statement that seems to undermine Paul's point in verse 13. He says that he was shown mercy because he acted ignorantly and in unbelief. Is Paul excusing himself here? Is he giving a reason why he actually deserved mercy from Jesus? Is it because he didn't know any better? Well, I don't think that's what's going on. If if Paul somehow had a claim on God's mercy, then mercy would no longer be mercy, would it? It would no longer be undeserved. And Paul's point throughout these verses would be undermined. I think it's helpful to remember that ignorance in the Bible is not an excuse. In the Bible, we are culpable for our ignorance. We have chosen to suppress the truth about God so that we can live our lives our own way. And so because Paul was ignorant of Jesus, living in rebellion against him, without faith in him, he needed to be shown mercy. If we read the sentence again and put the emphasis on the mercy, not on the because, I think that helps us. I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly and in unbelief. It's further proof of just how little he deserved and just how much he received. But it's not just mercy that was shown to Paul. He was also shown grace, verse 14. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. We sing a song at church that begins, grace unmeasured, vast and free. The song goes on, grace amazing, pure and deep. It goes further, grace abounding, strong and true. 
And finally, grace unending all my days. John Newton captured it in the words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. John Bunyan wrote the book, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. Christians are those who have been captivated and amazed by grace. And in verse 14, when Paul reflects on the grace that God has shown him, God's undeserved kindness and love that he has been shown, he searches round for a word, trying to capture that um, in, in words. And he does it by actually making up a word in the original Greek. He takes the word abound, and he adds on to the front of it the word hyper. The grace of God didn't just abound to Paul. That doesn't quite capture it. It hyperabounded, it superabounded to Paul. God's grace was like a dam filling up from one side with torrents and torrents of water, pressing in on the side and then finally bursting to Paul. That's what grace is like. And this overwhelming, amazing grace brought to Paul both the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. When God showed grace to Paul, undeserving, blasphemous, violent Paul, he also gave him the gift of faith and a heart of love. He went from being a man of unbelief, as we saw in verse 13, to being someone who believed in the one he was persecuting. He went from being a violent man to being a man who loved God and loved the churches and poured himself out in ceaseless love for others throughout his life. That is the overwhelming, unstoppable effect of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. But we might be asking ourselves, how can this be so? How can God show mercy and kindness to someone who deserves wrath? How can a sinner receive salvation? Well, let's come secondly to overwhelming grace for undeserving sinners. Paul steps back now and he begins to apply his own story into the lives of those who are listening to this letter. He doesn't want us to stop with him, but to widen our gaze and to consider what his experience of salvation teaches us about God's universal salvation for sinners. And it's captured in these words in verse 15. Have a look at verse 15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. The way Jesus related to Paul at this one moment in history teaches us about the way that Jesus will relate to all people who believe in him. Now, Paul says this saying deserves full acceptance. That means acceptance personally, uh, that we fully accept and believe this statement, but also universal acceptance that the world, that our city, believes these words too. Jesus didn't come into the world to bring social reform or to start a new self-help program or merely to leave us an example to follow. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Remember that the law exposes sin, but Jesus saves sinners and he can even save the worst of them. That's how Paul describes himself, the worst of sinners. Now, I don't think Paul is making a scientific statement when he says that. He didn't speak to every person in the ancient world and go through all the kind of annuals of of history and calculate everybody's sins and then think, am I worse than theirs? Yeah, I think I'm the worst of sinners. But he is being genuine when he describes himself like this. It's a statement that, that does accurately describe the reality of Paul's sin, doesn't it, as we've been seeing. His life was one of active rebellion against Jesus. He was a blaspheming, murderous, violent man. But as well as describing the reality of his sin, I wonder whether this statement also captures Paul's deep impression of his own sin. He feels himself to be the worst of sinners. Paul knows his own heart better than the heart of anyone else. He has seen and experienced and felt the consequences of his own sin. And so as far as Paul is concerned, he is the worst of sinners. And yet he, even Paul, is a sinner whom Christ Jesus came into the world to save. Now, it's only through Christ and through his coming, as we see in this verse, that mercy can now flow to sinners like Paul. When Christ came into the world, he did not rebel against God. He lived perfectly under God's law. He was righteous and blameless and good. But when Christ came into the world, he also knew that he would be hung on a cross to die. 
so that in his own body, he could take the punishment from God that lawbreakers like you and me and the Apostle Paul should be taking themselves. The wrath of God was poured out on Jesus at the cross so that the grace of God might be poured out on us. Do you see that God doesn't just ignore Paul's ignorance and blasphemy and violence and persecution? What Paul deserved, Jesus took. What we deserve, Jesus paid for, so that we might receive mercy and grace from him. And Paul said if mercy was available to him, then mercy is also available to us. Look at verse 16. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now, you probably know that experience of uh, driving along in the car and seeing a low bridge up ahead or maybe a tight road that you need to travel down and wondering whether you can get through. And if you see a large lorry or a van um, driving through ahead of you, then you know it's going to be no problem for you in your uh, little car. They can pass through, you can pass through. It's similar with Paul's life. The chasm was huge, as we've seen, between what he deserved and what he received. But if God was patient with Paul, then there is hope for sinful you and me. Paul's story sketches out the pattern for what God will do for every sinner who believes on Jesus for eternal life. Now, the more I look at these verses, and I mentioned that there's lots of I's and and me's in in Paul's description here, but the more we look at these verses, the more Paul sort of fades into the background, doesn't he? And Christ Jesus comes into the foreground. The Christ who is full of mercy and who is abounding with grace and who is brimming with patience and who came into the world to save sinners. And so, fellow sinners, if you have been exposed by the law, Where will you go if not to Jesus Christ? Where will you turn if not to the one who is full of mercy and overflowing with patience? Will you fully accept this trustworthy saying of verse 15 that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst? If you do that, then you'll be someone who can say amen to Paul's words in verse 17 where he gives all the glory to God. He writes, now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. The false teaching of Ephesus was leading to inward-looking pride, wasn't it? But the gospel leads to outward-looking praise to God. Paul is astonished that this God of verse 17 would stoop down to save this sinner, that the eternal, immortal, invisible God would show mercy and patience to people like Paul and people like us. If we truly grasp how little we deserve and how much we have received, then we will end up where Paul ends up in verse 17, not giving a single shred of honour to ourselves, not thinking that we have contributed in the least to our salvation, but giving all the glory to the King of Ages. This, by the way, is one of the major problems with any form of Christianity that teaches that we have something to offer God. If you ever hear teaching that says that God reaches a hand down to us and then we need to uh, sort of do the rest and reach up a hand to God, even if God does 99% of the work, if we do 1%, if we think we've contributed even 1%, then at least some of the honour and glory goes to us. But this is not the gospel according to the Bible. The gospel message is undeserved salvation to undeserving sinners, all to the glory of God. And all of this, if we remember the context in 1 Timothy, all of this is driving at one important implication for Timothy, who is reading the letter. As he listens to the glorious truths of the gospel, and as the church listens in as well, the question is, will they fight to keep this gospel at the heart of the church? So thirdly and more briefly, the fight that guards the church. The last few verses we've just looked at remind us of the power of the gospel, don't they? Jesus has turned Paul's life upside down. He can turn the lives of this church family upside down. And so Paul now returns to his command that he gave to Timothy early on in the chapter and reminds him to fight 
the good fight. Have a look at verse 18. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by following them you may fight the good fight, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Now this instruction that Paul mentions in verse 18 is the instruction that we read about back in verse 3, to command false teachers not to teach false doctrine. If false teaching takes a hold in this church, do you see that then the gospel will be tragically lost? And that means that the message of salvation for sinners will be tragically lost. It is of eternal importance that the gospel is in the driving seat of this church. And so Paul again makes this command to Timothy, urging him to refute false teaching and to do so in keeping with the prophecies once made about him. Now given what we read uh, in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy about these prophecies, we'll see that in a few weeks' time, it seems as though these prophecies were words spoken to Timothy by a group of elders commissioning Timothy for church leadership. He was commissioned to be someone who preaches and teaches the word of God. And so Paul is saying he needs to keep preaching and teaching no matter how hard it is. And it will be hard. As we thought about at the beginning, um, the language of verse 18 is warfare language. It's used again in 2 Timothy to describe a soldier serving their commanding officer. People might view the work of a Christian minister Um, as a bit of a walk in the park, Vicar of Dibley, that kind of thing. But Paul sees the task of ministry as like a war being waged on the battlefield. It is a battle for minds and hearts, a battle to keep the message of salvation in the driving seat. It is hard and tiring and costly. It is a fight of immense personal cost. We see an example of this kind of cost involved in leadership in the next couple of verses with these two men, Hymenaeus and Alexander. These were two leaders in the church in Ephesus, but because they have rejected a good conscience and have wandered away from the faith of the gospel, Paul says that he has handed them over to Satan. Now that sentence is most likely referring to the exercise of church discipline. If you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the same language is used there. These leaders needed to be put out of the church excommunicated, barred from teaching. Just imagine the immense personal cost of a decision like that. Having to put two leaders out of a church for the sake of preserving the truth of the gospel. That is one example of the costly fight that gospel ministers are engaged in. But as well as taking the fight to others by refuting error and correcting falsehood, Timothy is also to fight for his own faith. As we see in verse 19, he must hold on to the things that Hymenaeus and Alexander have rejected, faith and a good conscience. In other words, one of the dangers that faces a leader in this fight for the gospel is their own love of sin. As we saw last week, it's all too easy for a leader to mould their teaching to match their morality, to change their doctrine in order to live out their desires. And sadly, it's something that we see time and time again. A leader who is driven by the love of money will be tempted to preach the prosperity gospel or favour wealthy members in the church because of their desires. A church leader who wants to engage in some form of sexual immorality is going to have to change their teaching and their doctrine in order to match that lifestyle. Love of sin can lead a Christian to let go of the sound teaching that conforms to the gospel. And so do you see that the fight that Timothy must continue to wage is also a fight for his own soul. He must watch his life and his doctrine closely. Otherwise, the ship of his faith will head to the rocks. And it won't just be Timothy's faith that is rocked, but the faith of the whole church family too. This is the fight. A fight for the hearts of his hearers, but also a fight for the heart of the preacher. This is what the church so desperately needs, isn't it? Gospel-centered, gospel-hearted ministry led by gospel-hearted leaders. 
But this is not just what the church needs, this is what the world needs. So that the truth of Jesus Christ and the message of his salvation might be held up and held out to a world that so desperately needs to hear about their saviour. So as we conclude, let's think about these verses by reminding ourselves of two important truths that we've seen in 1 Timothy. As a local church, we are part of something that is hard, but we're also part of something that is glorious. The Christian life and the fight for the truth and the work of holding out the truth to the world will firstly be hard. It will be painful. It will be costly. If we want an easy path as a church, then there is a simple way that we can have it. We can decide to let go of the truth and conform to our culture and change the sound doctrine that we have received and refrain from holding out the exposing light of the law and to shrink back from declaring Christ's salvation to sinners. And let me say that that path is attractive because it's much more comfortable, isn't it? We can see why Christians and why churches choose to go down that road because it means that we don't have to say the hard things. It means that we don't have to criticise the prevailing cultural norms in our society or perhaps harder still to criticise false teaching within Christianity. But to be a gospel-loving Christian and to be a gospel-loving church and to be that kind of church that will keep going for the long term, that will cost us. We have a fight on our hands. It's firstly a fight, as we've seen in these verses, for the leaders of a local church who are fighting on two fronts, fighting to guard the truth in the church and to faithfully proclaim the truth in the world. Maybe we should say three fronts, also fighting for their own soul. It is a costly ministry. And so if you're a younger man or or an older man here, considering whether to set aside your life in set-apart ministry and to serve the gospel full-time, then you need to be ready for a fight, a fight that continues week after week and year after year. And where a leader will most feel the cost of this ministry will be in the areas of teaching that are most controversial in that society. For us in our day, as we've been thinking about issues of human sexuality and flourishing, or the exclusivity of Christ, or the fight to challenge and confront the radical individualism that pervades our culture. And it is in these battles that a church leader must fight. Just listen to these words on the screen from Martin Luther, who's the 16th century German reformer. I think he's helpful on this point. He writes, If I profess with loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christ. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all the battlefield besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. Do you see what he's saying there? Christian leaders cannot shy away from the fight, especially on those points that are most controversial where the battle is raging. Please pray for your leaders that we would be men like this. But the fight is not just for the leaders in a church. We're all listening in, aren't we? This letter has been leaked to the church family. And if you've ever been involved in teaching our children and young people, for example, you'll know that you too are engaged in a battle for hearts and minds. Week after week, seeking to overturn wrong thinking and to hold up the glorious truth for our children to hear. It's a battle raging in our personal conversations and interactions. It is very hard, isn't it, to confront a Christian friend who might be believing the wrong thing or who seems to be abandoning a good conscience. But every decision we make to move towards that friend in love and to speak the truth in love is a decision to fight the good fight. I had a conversation with someone recently and it felt like the conversation itself was a fight for the gospel. I could see how false teaching had taken a hold for this person. And I was fighting in love to hold out the gospel to him, praying that he might believe it. And so these verses are a reminder to us, aren't they, to fight the good fight, contending for the true gospel in our homes, with our children, in our youth groups, in our conversations with one another, and in the world. Because as well as being part of something that is hard, we are also part of something that is glorious. Glorious. 
I've just finished reading The Hobbit. Um, I was reading it partly to see if it was appropriate for my older children to read, but also because I just wanted to read the story. Um, and at the heart of the story, if you know it, is this hard journey that the dwarves and Bilbo Baggins go on in order to, to get their hands on the treasure at the heart of the mountain. The treasure protected by the terrifying dragon Smaug. They're willing to fight and to go without food and to endure hardship for the sake of this earthly treasure under the mountain. Well, Paul in these verses has held out to us the glorious, precious truth of the gospel, hasn't he? The gospel that alone can bring salvation for sinners exposed by the law, a gospel that alone can transform individuals as they experience God's unlimited mercy and grace and patience. It's that gospel that we are fighting for. If local churches like ours don't fight to hold on to and hold out that truth, then no one else will. The tennis club that you're part of won't hold out the gospel. Neither will the social club or the university society. Our media and newspapers won't be holding out the gospel, nor will our government or the United Nations or the companies of Silicon Valley. The gospel is given to ordinary local churches like ours so that we might be the pillar and foundation of the truth in a world that so desperately needs the truth. And so what a glorious thing to be involved in. What a glorious fight to be engaged in. And the more we are thrilled by this gospel, and the more we keep this message of salvation at the heart of all we do as a church family, then the more eager we will be to fight the good fight, not just this week, but week after week and year after year, far beyond 2027, but for generations to come. So why do we pray as we end that God would strengthen us by his grace for that task? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that the gospel is worth fighting for. Thank you that Christ Jesus came into the world to bring salvation to sinners. We ask that please you would strengthen us to keep fighting this fight to hold on to the gospel as a church and as individuals. Help us especially when this is costly and hard. And please help us to hold out this gospel to our world. May our lives and our witness bring glory to you, our King Eternal, in Jesus' name. Amen.